Okay, so I think we've got pretty much everyone in the room. Um, so I think we're going to go ahead and get started. We're right on the spot. We've got a lot of content to provide to you today. And I'm really excited to be here. Um, I've been, you know, in this industry for 20 years. I know, I just, I shaved. <laughs> you, you don't see the gray hairs anymore because I, I cleaned up a little bit for today and got my hair cut and uh, decided to look a little bit, you know, when I, when I get uh, cleaned up, I look a little bit younger. Um, so I've been doing this for 20 years now. And been doing this, you know, for many years, back in, uh, when I started in, in IT in 1992. And I've uh, been through many transitions. And one of the exciting things about today is that the Bry Forum is really talking about all the evolutions of what we've been seeing for the last, you know, 10 years, starting with, you know, the virtualization of BDI and evolving into things like uh, bring your own device, consumerization, and now more and more in the last couple of years where we're seeing um, enterprise mobility, uh, et cetera. And one of the things that you're probably not aware of is that Symantec um, are in each of those areas. We provide, you know, very, very strategic uh, solutions into solving a lot of those. And uh, what we want to do is to show you today is some of the things which our customers have done with our solutions that are really solving, you know, the journey starting with virtual, you know, virtual desktop, moving into how to take that applications and that technology to solve BYOD and bring your own computers, which we're seeing a lot of those initiatives picking up. And then also uh, the convergence of traditional management, laptops and desktops, as virtualization and enterprise mobility all coming together in the end all the things that we need to solve going forward. So we see up here some of the things I just wanted to highlight. I mean, things have been changing so fast. I've been doing 20 years and I've never seen changes in IT in the past three years have accelerated beyond I could have believed. Um, and it's exciting. It's an exciting time for you and exciting time for me. So we're seeing things like, you know, tradition of, of explosion of devices, trends, and it's changing so fast that IT is struggling to keep up with it. Some of the reasons why you're here today is to listen how we are helping you know, speed up the adoption of those technologies and make it easier for you to, you know, uh, deliver better IT services to your customers or your end users. So one of the things that we wanted to highlight as a result of that is that with, uh, with Brian Madden, uh, we decided that we would do a video to kind of highlight some of the things that you may not be aware that Symantec does. So to give you a little bit of an insight into uh, what we're able to deliver. So a little video. Hope you have a sign from, the, from this. Yeah, audio. Video. Anybody have any ideas? The thing is, they do so many different things. What are we going to focus on? There's app virtualization. Yeah, app like they like have enterprise mobility management. Yeah, app streaming. Yeah, BYOD. BDI. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, since this is for Bry Forum, why don't we have a bunch of things for Brian? Does really embarrassing stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like we, yeah. Could get it, we could get them on the street with one of those sandwich board signs and have like a megaphone, and he could be on the street telling everybody about the great stuff. Yeah. Or they have this thing where they pre-configure an application to make them easier to deploy, like like they're pre-cooked or something. So what if we have Brian throwing pre-cooked burritos out of the window or something? You can't throw burritos at people. Well, sure, they're, they're, they're cooked. They're not frozen. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if I like that idea. Okay, what if we have Brian running down the street with a semantic kite behind him? <laughs> yeah, like he's blown away that Symantec can virtualize IE 6, 7, and 9 all in the same box. Uh, I don't know if that's that funny, though. What if he's naked? <laughs> I love it. Guys, no, nothing that can get me arrested. Okay, well, if you don't want to get arrested, then instead, why don't we just put you in a drag? You know, you can show how semantic applications can fit in anywhere. These ideas are getting ridiculous. These yeah, are great ideas. Really, do you really have really like better ideas? These are that. the ideas. You, have you to want to do these ideas? ideas? This is such <laughs> shit. Good luck doing these ideas without me. So we're totally doing this without him, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. 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 All right. And that's why semantic virtual applications behave like regular applications. Take it from me, Brian Matt. Um, it was good, but next time try it a little bit more. More arrogantly. No, 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 like a diva. Yeah, and enunciate more of the weird accent. Wave your arms all over the place. And tell everybody how everything works all the time. How do you feel about getting your ears pierced? Hey guys, good news. I decided to come back and help you all with the project. Oh, uh. great. You know what? I have the perfect job for you.
So it was it? Uh, apologies for the sound, but uh, what I'll try and do is at the end play it back a bit, and I'll put my microphone close to my laptop so you can all hear properly. But just to give you an idea is that you know we wanted to highlight some of the, the things that we do uh, across you know virtualization, uh, BYOD, application virtualization, streaming, and uh, enterprise mobility, just to highlight some of that. So what I'm going to now do is move into one of our main presenters. So we've got uh, Steve Scott here, who is a virtualization guru and has been doing this for many years and has been part of a large VDI project utilizing some of our technologies. And what I want to be able you know, to present, allow Steve to present is some of the things that you may be thinking about and some of the challenges you may be facing and how Steve has been able to solve those uh, with a very successful, uh, you know, was it VDI environment. So was it, give me a, was it a warm introduction to Steve and uh, I'll switch it over for you. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. So I'm an independent consultant now, but uh, spent 10 years as a strategy architect for um, a Fortune 10 company in the United States, uh, about 350,000 endpoints. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about how we use virtualization, some things we saw, some, uh, some added benefits that we didn't even think about at first that we got. So as every, I have a Citrix background, um, well, probably a lot of you are in that same boat. A lot of us who end up doing desktop virtualization end up having server-based computing background or desktop engineer background. It's all about the applications, right? It's the same thing we've been saying with Citrix. You know, how many users can you get on a server? It all depends on your applications. It's, come back to the same thing in BDI. Um, won't spend too much time on this because you guys are probably here and already know all this stuff and you're Brian, but. Um, and why all these things, why would I want to do VDI? Increased security, this is a hot topic, right? Is it more secure, is it less? I won't get into all that. I have um, my own beliefs on it. Sometimes that the political change can give you better security, but is it inherently more secure? Um, reduce support costs. Uh, this is a, was a very large issue for us. Um, we used uh, an external contractor for our desktop support. Uh, paid a very hefty amount every year for that for the support on each one of those desktops. Uh, so that was a big part of our VDI project to decrease the level of support needed on each one of those um, to just to reduce that overall uh, cost associated with it. Uh, power consumption, network usage, again, depending on where you go, the different ways there. Um, mobility. Uh, I think most users, that's what they want from VDI. I know. Myself, that was the big thing that I wanted. Uh, I wanted that same instance if I was at work or if I was at a client location or at home. I want my same user experience, right? I want to. I have. I have my applications. I have my shortcuts, um, all of my my folders and files. I want to be able to to get that anywhere. For the business, the biggest thing I think is agility, right? And the business needs to to be able to change. Uh, today, as fast as things change, that's, uh, business can either make a lot of money or lose a lot of money by being agile or not. Um, one of the other things, we, we didn't have really a BYOD initiative, but we saw that by implementing VDI, um, that a lot of our users did BYOD on their own. Um, so then we didn't have any eliminated that desktop support cost because now they don't even have a device that we own anymore. They just brought their own. We didn't have give them a stipend. Myself, for the last three years, I brought my own MacBook and used that for my endpoint device. The company didn't have to provide me with anything. Um, I just accessed my, my virtual desktop um, without any cost to the company. So the company saved on an endpoint device. They saved on a desktop support call for that, that device because now I'm supporting it myself. So it goes into the whole consumerization of IT that Brian's talking about. Um, so for me, I about five years ago moved to a partial telecommuter status, status and this is what I was talking about, the end users, they want mobility. Um, for the last couple years, full-time telecommuter, that's pretty much the view from my office anymore. So that, you, know, you have to think of you know, why are we doing all this? Um, in the end user's mind, this is the biggest benefit to VDI for me. I, as an end user, I could care how much it costs my company. If I can work from home and um, enable that, and then 
that goes back into the savings into the company. Uh, our, we closed down, I think it was like 60% of our offices in the last three years. Um, every, everything that was leased went away. Um, we, um, the, the only buildings we maintained were the ones that we actually owned, so we had a huge cost savings there um, as we allowed our users to move out and be, be mobile. They uh, had a tele we had a telecommute policy, you know, um, hotel and cubes, that whole initiative has saved us millions and millions of dollars by reducing just office space. So all that sounds great, right? Why wouldn't I want VDI, same thing. Um, it's difficult to implement well. Um, and I have this little scratch pad note up here from a client the other day uh, trying to do VDI and some of the basic things, right? You have to have a well-performing infrastructure. Um, this was, they basically had every NIC on all their virtual switches, um, nothing segmented. But that, that underlying infrastructure has to perform very well. Um, to be able to perform well. Uh, cost, again, does it save me money? Does it cost more money? A lot of it depends on what you deliver to the end user. Um, we'll dig some more into that. Um, another thing that some people don't think about is um, one outage can affect a large amount of your number of your users. So you have to take that into in account in your design, um, geolocation, multiple data centers. If I have I take every, v every desktop that I had and move it into one central data center and I lose a thing to that data center, can you afford to lose 100% of your users' desktops? You know, the, the cost and impact of the business. So make sure you think about those um, when you're designing this, uh, multiple locations, um, and uh, obviously uh, highly reliable. And again, the security debate. So uh, just real briefly, where's the cost? And change the slide to pounds since we're in London. So, and Brian talked about a little bit this morning in his uh, opening uh, about the cost of a desktop compute, right? It keeps going down and down. Server compute keeps going down and down. Um, but just some rough numbers on what, what I normally give a user in a desktop, what it cost me, and, and a server. And these are just the highlights. So I, I, say, I can save money on the compute itself, on processors. Um, basically because I'm giving the user less processors. Uh, memory, again, shared memory allows me to save cost on memory. But when it comes to the storage, storage is the big, the big cost I have. So how do I reduce my storage costs? Uh, cheap, cheaper storage. Um, obviously the performance impact uh, by using cheaper storage. Um, if you can't match what they have on their desktop today, um, you're not gonna have the end user support to for the, your VDI initiative. So this is, um, you know, for even using SAM-based storage, and there's all kinds of about, uh, and this isn't a storage talk, I just kinda wanna briefly go over this. Um, so I can accel accelerate uh, cheaper storage, right? NAS, NFS-based storage, um, caching tiering, different products out there, Fusion IO, Ilio, Atlantis Computing is here. Um, but all those usually have some additional cost to them what I'm trying to drive down to here is that uh, by, reducing, by reducing my storage requirements, that's the easiest way to reduce my storage cost. So a couple ways we can get around that storage duplication. Again, Brian talked about that a little bit, some of the new vendors in the last year, um, all going around storage duplication. But through the existing, um, and depending on what your VDI implementation here you're using, link clones or using PVS shared images are the two main ways that people will reduce on their, on their storage requirements. Um, so both of those, though, require, or don't require, but gain the most benefits from going to a single image. That's very hard to get to, all right? You have multiple different use cases, um, multiple different sets of applications, so very hard to get to a one single image to provide all your users. Um, so how can I get to that single image? Two different methods that we looked at, um, remote desktop, Zenapp, so I have a, basically a clean image that has none of my applications on it are very, you know, the core, maybe core applications, um, and then I deliver all my applications via Zenapp. One model, uh, the current project I'm working on, that's one of the ways that we're going at. We have 
very small, sm much smaller use case though, and very um, smaller set of applications. So, um, so that that's one method. Um, again, here may become two if do I already have Citrix RDS terminal server licensing? That, that can be a, a very large cost if if you don't if your users aren't currently using that environment today to add a terminal server of Citrix license to a VDI cost. I think it tips the cost model the other way where it becomes more expensive if you're not currently using an internet enterprise today. Uh, so the other methods is to use application virtualization streaming to get to that single image. And that's the method that we ended up using. Um, so we spent about six months looking at different virtualization vendors. Um, and, and really I would say longer than that, we had been looking at application virtualization for, I had been looking at it for you know, six, seven years uh, since SoftGrid, ThinStall, you know, all those companies who ended up getting bought out later on. So the, we had looked at, looked at everybody who was out there at the time, ended up coming down to the four major vendors, uh, Citrix Streaming, FinApp, AppV, and Semantic Workspace Streaming. So I took uh, 11 team, enter, team members. Um, some of those were technical, some of them were, um, we had a cost analysis guy. Um, and we took about six months to do this bake off. We brought each one of these products up in a complete production environment, production-like environment, um, and measured across, I think it was 48 each individual parameters for each one of these. Uh, at the end of it, we ended up coming to a unanimous decision. Um, and the biggest differentiators we had were uh, package success rate being the largest one. Um, and so the semantic model is different from any other, or most any other uh, virtual application virtualization <coughs> vendor, where they have a normally open model. Um, and being able, virtualizing at the kernel layer instead of at the user layer gave us much better success rates in the proof of concept than we were getting with the other products. Um, the other thing was performance. Uh, we saw degradation of performance with most of the other vendors um, when, and actually in semantic uh, virtualization, we saw a performance increase in most of our, because of, um, uh, we, actually, we actually saw performance increases in a lot of our applications versus uh, performance degradation in most of the other products. Uh, probably one of the biggest overall factors ended up being management though. Uh, Symantec offers a solution that provides, oh. thanks Jeff. Um, uh, integrated management. Uh, with their product, I had a solution to manage applications and if, and if any of you guys have been down this road to try to manage then app applications uh, in a you know VMware VDI environment um, can be a complete nightmare. Um, publishing shortcuts and you, because it has to integrate with your profile management tools. How do I manage my shortcuts? How do I manage those applications? Where do I store those applications? Um, Semantic has a complete management infrastructure that allows me to um, deploy on demand, uh, roll back. Um, maintain each each uh, version of those applications. So again, that that was a very large factor for us. But again, uh, I would suggest you know look at these products to your own. Um, and I, I stole the kind of the application virtual, virtualization smackdown from PQ, PQR. Um, they have some great white papers, um, and will give you a good framework to look at um, what things to measure and and their input. So, uh, Brian and VDI Delusion, this was one of his hits on doing a shared image and application, or single image, right? As no application virtualization product is capable of virtualizing 100% of your applications. I, there was a little bit more of that to there all the time or something like that. Um, so, for us, we had a 100% success rate in virtualizing our applications, so, uh, other than, uh, other than 16-bit applications being an old company, we had still had some legacy 16-bit applications. We knew that going into it that we couldn't get around that. So, 
Um, but other than 16-bit applications, we actually had 100% success rate. Some of them were hard. Um, some of them required um, you know, some in-depth, good, good packagers requirements. Um, some help from Symantec gave us some great help. Um, but we ended up having 100% success rate. So some, other, some benefits of the single image, right? Uh, storage reduction we talked about. So there's more than just, okay, I have, instead of having 10, minute, 10 images, I have one, so I use, uh, you know, one-tenth of the storage size. Um, if you, when you scale these environments out, start looking at your recompose time. So now if I have 10 images and I said to make it redundant, I need uh, to have it dispersed in many different locations. So now I have that same image in 10 different locations. So now instead of 10 images, I have 100 images. And you can see how the, the storage requirements and the, and the administration overhead time as these type of solutions scale out just uh, become very large. Um, And uh, so sim simplifying the support, if my, uh, we actually didn't even really have desktop support anymore, but my tier two support, um, they know what that image looks like. If I, if I go to that single image, instead of having 10 different flavors, you know, help desk this gets this, um, call center gets that, um, having different set of applications, that's the same image across all those. It was just kind of another added benefit that we saw after, um, that we didn't really think of at first. So uh, <laughs> sometimes admin overhead can be a good thing. Um, I had to show off my big striper I caught a couple days ago. Um, this was, I was waiting for an image preparation that they were supposed to have done. I was supposed to do some work that night. I was waiting around, so while I was waiting, I went down to my dock, and did some fishing, and a guy comes back and he's like, oh, I'm sorry, you know, sorry, I was supposed to, you know, thought I'd have it done earlier. I'm like, that's all right. I texted him this picture and was like, for you, for you uh, not getting that done in time, I got to go do this and catch this 24-pound uh, striper off my dock. So. Other benefits of application virtualization? Didn't take some automation out. So XP migration. Um, uh, now we're under a year from uh, XP into life. Uh, it's usually at the top of most, most companies to-do list, right, this year, get off XP. Um, by virtualizing these applications, the same application runs across both platforms, so it can prepare you for that Windows 7 migration. Um, the other thing uh, that we, this was a very large benefit to us, is by virtualizing these applications, these are XP legacy applications that were not Windows 7 compatible, um, by virtualizing them became Windows 7 compatible. So it removed those roadblocks we had from migrating to Windows XP. And this, I think I have it on one of the other slides, later slides, is um, as far as like cost savings from BDI, and well, this was probably the largest cost savings we had because um, for vendors to re go in and redo applications for Windows 7 compatibility, everybody wants millions of dollars, you know, for, uh, to recode these applications, we took those, app virtualized them, and reduced the, uh, or eliminated or deferred all those costs. Application rationalization, another huge benefit that we didn't really think of at first. We had an entire team that all they did was application rationalization. So you're in charge of Adobe products, and it's your, um, your job to, on these 350,000 endpoints, find out which Adobe product is there, make sure Flash is the current version. If not, you know, go remove that, have a removal package created, have a distribution package created to update them. Oh, a security patch came out. Now that's all, you know, um, you have to go do that again this week. Uh, we had a large t team that that's all they did was for remedi application re re remediation and application rationalization. Um, using Symantec streaming, uh, we, essentially eliminated a lot of those positions. Because um, now that I have immediate reporting, I know every, everyone who's using the virtualization client, I know what application they have. Um, I can immediately force them to the next application, to the next revision. If there's an issue, I can immediately roll them back. 
uh, huge amount of man hours and time savings um, from, from that aspect. Uh, developer environments. And again, one of these things we didn't really think of and uh, a client ended up coming to us and saying, hey, we have a, uh, developers, they spend about 40 hours setting up each one of their environments and we need some type of solution to try to eliminate this cost. These are contractors. Um, so by using uh, Symantec virtualization, we were able to virtualize their suite of tools and the, the initial setup. So they would do a project at the end of it, reset their applications and have their, um, their pristine development environment back. Um, so that ended up saving us like 32,000 contract developer hours a year in just one, one project, 200 developers. So some of the, the small things, I think the, the point here what I'm trying to make is that, yeah, when you do the cost analysis, um, sometimes VDS wash, sometimes it's cheaper, sometimes it's more expensive. Um, but looking at the tools that get us there, application virtualization, profile management, there's a lot of added benefits that you don't see in that, that cost analysis. Um, and, and you can extend those same solutions off to the traditional desktop and gain those same results there. Because we, we virtualized 10, 15% of, we used VDI for about 15% of our clients, or of our endpoints. But um, these benefits are, aren't reduced, like these developer environments, those were traditional, they were their laptops, right? So we used application virtualization out to those traditional endpoints and reaped the same benefits there. Uh, Citrix environments as well, as well. Uh, we were the largest Citrix shop. Um, anybody who's a Citrix admin knows the, the biggest, a Citrix server itself is inherently stable. You start installing applications on it is where you, you your issues. Um, and also shared environments, being able to move load around, move applications around, uh, but using streaming, I'm isolating that application from my operating system and enables me to move applications around depending on load for each server. I mentioned that works in a traditional environment. Um, so kind of our, our bottom line, we ended up saving about $40 for, so a traditional desktop, um, with all their traditional applications and stuff installed on it. Moving that to the data center, we ended up saving about, about $40 a desktop. It's not, not the end of the world, but it's not more expensive, um, which I think ended up being about one point, large environment, $1.6 million. I'm gonna sneeze that, but. Um, so it, w where did we, we really saw our cost savings and all those other additional benefits? Um, support cost, again, like I said, we had a very large support contract. We moved to a model, um, each one of those desktops was no longer covered under that support contract. There was no longer a tier one support. If uh, you had an application issue, you reset your application. If you have an issue beyond that and your desktop doesn't work, you reboot your desktop and you have a new desktop. So there's no longer a requirement for a, a tier one type desktop support personnel. Um, and some of these other things, uh, desktop delivery and install. Um, we had you know, employees that, and it took forever. You know, you order a new desktop or whatever, you're not allowed to touch it. Someone has to come out and unplug your old one, plug the new one in, still transfer data over. A lot of those old legacy processes that we were still doing. Um, so we completely eliminated that for those new endpoints because now if either you're either getting a solid state device, right, and allowed them to just plug that in on their desk. Um, the other thing was application desk side install. We still had actually desktop support technicians coming out with a USB key or a CD when, you know, Nancy wants this new spreadsheet application. If, if it was under like a certain amount of users, we still had people going out to the office and installing that um, on, on their PC or laptop. Um, so we eliminated that by virtualizing all those applications, having a self-service front end. Uh, the other, a lot of times that would take weeks to schedule that ticket and get that application installed. So now, complete self-service, go to the web front end, clicks your application, gets the virtualized application down, doesn't need admin rights. 
Um, I, I mentioned this a little bit about this, uh, Windows 7 compatibility. So our cost savings from that alone was nearly $20 million. Just from taking Windows XP applications that were not Windows 7 compliant and making them Windows 7 compliant. Uh, okay, so one of, one of the other uh, things we ran into um, came along was uh, exception processing. So big company, we have software standards, you're allowed to install this, you're not allowed to install this. But there's an exception process that would allow them to um, install applications that are offside of that. And again, this was desktop support side ticket, somebody would come out. Um, but we, we had a very large number of these for browsers. Um, we had a large, large numbers of groups who do for um, website testing for, you know, we both host and provide web, web hosting and um, so they needed to do all this browser integration testing. So we did like 40,000 exceptions a year just for internet browsers. I need Chrome, I need Firefox, I need IE8, I need IE9. Um, so by virtualizing each one of those, it gave me management over what they had. So now not only did I have to, instead of having a paper trail and someone following that paper trail to say, Joe has you know, uh, Chrome installed on his desktop and in six months his exception is up and we need to go and make sure that Chrome's no longer installed on his desktop or bounce that against reporting. Um, now I have instant access to that in a management console and I can expire that to say, you know, in six months, Joe no longer has Chrome, we're gonna take it away from him. Um, so yeah, we, it was estimated about 10,000 man hours a year we spent on just managing these, just internet browser exceptions. Uh, I talked a little bit about application rationalization already, uh, the developer project, I think I've hit most of these. Um, again, uh, bring your own device. I talked about this at the beginning. Those users who just ended up using their device without any co company supported BOOD initiative. Um, I'll talk a little bit about agility. I mentioned that at the beginning about for a business, for the user, mobility is what I want. For the business, agility is what I'm looking for. We had uh, two specific examples of this. Um, one was being Hurricane Isaac this is in the United States, southwestern United States. Um, large hurricane wiped out a lot of our call centers. Uh, we found from that one, we weren't, that was at the point where we were just kind of starting to build a lot of this environment. Um, but we, we immediately brought up a, another cluster of desktops, um, used that, uh, moved those call center reps from other locations into those, um, into desktops. And so big company, a lot of different uh, legacy companies come together. Each one of our regions were segmented by applications. So if you're a, you answer the phones in Atlanta, you have a completely different set of applications than you did in Texas. Um, so the, uh, we were able to move those applications from those Texas users by using the application virtualization directly into the southeast um, area applications. So now we had those call center reps placing orders, uh, taking repair orders, um, and being able to support the customers from, that, from those, those call centers when our other call centers were down. Um, from that, we, we learned that, okay, this is a great disaster, uh, disaster recovery scenario. And from that, we had everything kind of in place. Um, and actually, so during Sandy, uh, this is another early last year, um, in the Northeast this time, a different region, um, and we were praised in all the publications and stuff about uh, basically had no downtime. Other vendors were coming using our resources um, to be able to support their end users. Um, so again, so some of these other benefits that when you're looking at these projects um, and, the, and the cost may be a, a wash, but you've, you've got to look into the bigger benefits, right? What, what does that agility buy me? Uh, so this one is a little bit on the security thing, right? So uh, Brian mentioned it this morning. If you walk out to a user's desk today, 
and say, hey, I'm going to reimage your desktop and take all your admin rights away, you know, not going to happen. Right? Your user's not going to be happy. So, and, and maybe that's the case in a small, medium sized company. Um, and, and large business, um, we, this gave us a catalyst to one, as I mentioned, multiple companies came together, so you have all these different images. It gave us a catalyst to go to one single image. Uh, it gave us a catalyst to um, share these applications across those images. It gave us a catalyst to take those admin rights that way from different users had them already. Um, and gave us a seamless method to give them ability to install their own applications, to use those applications um, without them really noticing that you have, that they don't have admin rights. And you do that all in the same time when you're doing a platform change from XP to Win7 or Win8, um, you can pretty much get away with no user, as long as you provide a good environment, a good performing environment for your users, our users loved it. They were knocking down the door to come, come to it. Um, we, we had backlogs a year long of people wanting to get in the environment. Um, and again, I think a lot of that goes back to that, that mobility. Right. Um, actually, one other thing too about like, agility and BYOD is uh, mobile devices. That was the other thing. We immediately saw people just finding use cases to use their iPads or their iPhones. Um, we had um, managers in, in call centers that used to, um, somebody had a new, uh, you know, new user or whatever, I, I, I don't know how to use that this application or I'm having this problem. Um, they started picking up their iPads. Yeah, you don't want that full desktop experience on an iPad. You use it every day. But what they could do is they could walk up behind that user and have their, their desktop and their iPad and, and basically show them, walk them through. They used it as training tools for their, for their people. Um, again, one of these things that kind of didn't really think about, we thought it was going to be a detrimental to our WAN. Um, we actually saw about a 30 cent 30% reduction in WAN traffic. Um, and again, this all depends on your users and how they use it and stuff. But for us, we saw a 30% 30, 30 reduction in WAN traffic because my, my theories are most of that. So now you're taking, um, we had a lot of data center based applications already. Um, so we're moving that endpoint into the data center. And so that you get the same benefits with Citrix, right? You would do the same thing where that the compute's happening in the data center, communications back and forth. But the other big thing was web traffic. And, uh, and when, our, when we use Citrix for all these environments, users still had a browser on their endpoint on, our, on their desktop. And all that was going to central um, ISP links. Um, so that was using um, traffic in each one of those locations. Um, so by, but by now, all that traffic came out of the data center. So in other smaller environments, I've seen where um, you can actually reduce or eliminate your kind of branch office ISP links. So you just, you just provide that WAN link. Um, now the desktop's in the data center. Um, so now all the web browsing and all the traffic comes directly from the data center. Does your branch office even need an ISP connection anymore? So another one of those benefits that I don't think about. I actually mentioned that, right? branch office. Sure. Thank you very much. So, was it? Uh... So, from Steve. So, at this point, we have a couple of minutes. So, we, if you have any specific questions you want to ask Steve about, you know, experiences or things that may be relevant to your, your situations, um, so feel free to ask a few questions at this time. I think we have a microphone at the back. That, if you have questions to ask, so just raise your hand, and we'll bring the microphone to you. So, we have about five minutes for questions. Anyone questions? Anyone not have questions? <laughs> have a question at the back. Hi, Steve. Um, I may have missed it, um, but how many users and devices in your environment? Um, th almost 350,000. Uh, users. OK. So any other questions? Okay, so everyone's shocked and absorbing the information. So <laughs> at this point, thank you, Steve. I'm going to kind of sure. move on to, to another one of the scenarios. So what I'm really, I'm really excited about this next topic um, that um, we heard about Steve mentioning about VDI and some of the things that they were doing around the virtual desktop. 
and been able to you know, solve you know, what was initially putting them a you know, virtual environment um, in order to get access to a single image and uh, saving costs of virtualization, et cetera. And we heard a lot of other things coming out of it, things like disaster recovery, security, you know, development environments, all uh, saving significant amounts of money. And also with Windows, you know, Windows XP migration to Windows 7, you know, Windows XP is still approximately 40% of the desktop. It actually had an increase this year, even though we have what, you know, less than 12 months left of XP support. And many people out there are thinking, you know, okay, Hardigan and I quickly adopt many of the applications they use. Um, application virtualization can help you accelerate that. So it's an important thing to know that, you know, with uh, many people still having to go through an XP migration, that that's a very important topic. But one of the things I'm going to talk about is that we have all these scenarios up here that we're trying to address. You know, we had Steve talking about the VDI, the virtualization. We've got all these devices up here that are really coming in and really changing the way we deliver um, IT services to the, to the users. We've got cloud applications. We've got multiple devices. There are new operating systems coming out as well that we need to consider. So one of the things that I worked on for the past two years was an interesting project. It was basically, how do we really take what we've done in BDI and make sure that we actually enable it for BYOD, for a project that allows you know, users to use their own devices? So for example, I could go out to the shop today, buy a device with an operating system preloaded pre on it, and still get all the business applications in order for me to do my work. So if I dropped that device, jumped up and down on it, you know, threw it over the, you know, into the, you know, the, was it the Thames River here, I could go and buy another device immediately with a different, you know, maybe I bought a Windows XP and maybe I went to the shop tomorrow and bought a Windows 7 device and go and get the same services immediately to go and enroll myself and get um, that same experience with the applications, okay? So this is what BYOD is all about, and this is some of the things that you're here to, to learn about. So one of the things, this is what we find in the scenario that we actually were delivering a BYOD scenario. It was an unmanaged device, so we hadn't any knowledge about the device at all. All we did was basically, the, the, we knew about the user. It's all about the user and applications. So we know who the user was. They have an Active Directory account. We know what um, department or what organization they're part of and what applications that they're allowed to be provisioned. So we needed to be able to deliver business applications to unmanaged devices, devices that don't have any management capabilities on them, okay? The other use case was we need to be able to do on-demand. We need to be able to deliver applications on-demand when they needed them. We also needed to be able to rent applications, so applications that had a monthly cost or subscription model, we needed to deliver them for a time basis and then remove them. And we also needed to deliver them as a service as well. We also needed to keep, one of the key components here was is if you're delivering to unmanaged devices, the key component here was that if they were chargeable applications, you needed to be able to retain the license, a way of actually claiming the license back. Because getting it from an unmanaged device, you know, you had to be able to understand a way to actually remove that license in order to keep within your license compliance. And we also had to basically work alongside other applications because we didn't know anything about that device. We didn't know what other applications were on the device. We didn't know, you know, the configuration of the device, but we still needed to work alongside applications that are, you know, incompatible. So, you know, where you're in a managed environment, um, you know what applications are on that device, you know the compatibility conflicts, you know how to, to manage and deliver and do dependencies, et cetera, through intelligent software management. But when you don't know anything about the device, the only thing you know is about the user, the apps have to work alongside everything else on that device. So semantic apps work along happily together with other applications, either, you know, was it side by side or uh, isolated uh, in multiple ways. And it also allows us to basically merge the gap between traditional management, VDI, BYOD, and enterprise mobility, bringing all of those into the collective into, you know, being able to deliver um, a service for those. So the, the scenario I'm gonna talk about now is that we had, this was the environment that we had to deliver the service to. We had over 80,000 teachers that had a managed device. They had something that was given to them that had a, you know, an operating system that was been managed that they had a way to deliver traditionally uh, software to. But we also had 300,000 students that were bringing their own devices in, whether it was MacBooks or Windows 7 devices or whether it was you know, um, iPads or Android devices, and we still needed to deliver the services to those users. Now historically, what they did was they would have had the, all of these, this is an educational side of things, hence the students. So um, they, they had a challenge was that they had all these university labs that were growing and growing and growing, many labs in order to facilitate the students' education because as universities, you know, move from the book to the, you know, technology. They move from, you know, historically 
um, all of the kind of you know, educational books that was done from study, and now all their education is done through IT and computing. And they had to deliver applications, whether it's math, science, art, um, you know, computing, programming. They had to deliver applications for them to do their work. Now, they had to manage all these labs with operating systems for one person to access Photoshop. And that person could access Photoshop for maybe two hours a day, tw two days a week, to do their, their education, to do, you know, was it to learn. And our next generation of staff, our next generation of, you know, native digitals, uh, was it uh, digital natives? Uh, backwards, right? But uh, we had to be able to deliver and how do we just reduce the cost? Because over the past couple of years, students started bringing their own devices in. They came into the lab and they sit down and got their, their lab machine with the application that we were providing and they had their own laptop or iPad or device. So we decided, you know, how do we, we reduce the cost significantly? So what we ended up doing was, with these students bringing their own devices in, we actually took the application virtualization piece out of the VDI and delivered it directly to the students. We delivered a portal that they go to to basically enroll their device and access the applications streamed to the device, which means that they can now take that device home with them, access the applications from home, and Active Directory was tied in for the license compliance. So as long as they kept logging into Active Directory, and as long as Active Directory was inactive and enabled, that meant that their license was compliance. The minute they didn't log in, it voided um, over a time period that that license would no longer be used and the application would go away. So I'll show you, I've got a demo video here of it actually working. So for yourself to be able to see uh, this here. So I'll walk you through the use case here. So basically this is an unmanaged device going to a web page, a portal page, and this could be you know, public based, it could be private based, this could be you know, your internet site, and they're logging into the portal with an unmanaged device. All they have is an Active Directory account. They're just a registered user in the location. And as they log in, they're basically, you know, maybe a math student or a programming student. And this could be HR, it could be IT, it could be, you know, your marketing team. And they have all the things that's relevant to them on the portal page. Their location, you know, tools, important information, news feeds. Um, and on the right-hand side, they have this location for their app store. And actually, in this scenario, it was quite interesting that the use case was that they were, you know, this was replacing the start button. <laughs> Hence, you know, I think that's why Microsoft removed it eventually. Um, so we now have here, I assume one of the requirements is they need to roll the device for the virtualization and streaming technology. So they need to be able to enroll it. So basically here, what's happening is that user's now installing um, uh, an agent that allows them to now access applications. Um, the reboot occurs. Now when they log back in again with this unmanaged device, we still don't know anything about the device. But now the user has now applications published to them that they can now access. So when they log back into the site again, they now have access to all the ad applications, and this could be printer drivers, it could be Photoshop, it could be AutoCAD, it could be Office, it could be different versions of browsers. Uh, for a Mac user, it could also be a VDI environment in the back end. So for a Mac user coming in, they could also have a VDI provision for them. So now when they go back into the applications, they'll now see that they have a wide range of, these are sample applications, but these could be browsers, they could be uh, you know, different uh, applications for them to do the work, and it could be marketing applications, it could be cloud-based applications as well. This could be Office 365 in the cloud, it could be Google uh, and Docs. Um, as you can see here, this is just a hyperlink to one, but the next one you'll see that we actually go to is an application will be streamed down to this machine. I guess like one, one pad, or no pad. So when they click in it, they now have an application it gets streamed onto the device, unmanaged, BYOD scenario. A couple of seconds occurs, application is now streamed on and available offline. They can take it home, they can access it from home, they can do the work, they can use it on a plane, um, and then um, as long as they keep logging in to Active Directory once a month, they have that application, as long as it's provisioned for them. It is. So these are some of the exciting things about going outside of the box and going beyond what we've traditionally done and being able to really evolve, because you know, VDI is, is, is an costly project for, for many companies. And to be able to take, you know, where some companies, small or medium companies, may not be able to uh, facilitate a VDI environment, this was being able to use the same technology that enables and reduces the cost of VDI, but being able to now take it to BYOD. So um, at this point in time, I'm gonna now pass it over to my colleague here, who's now gonna tie in where I've talked about you know, laptops and, 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 and uh, netbooks, et cetera. Uh, my colleague Darren here is now gonna tie in more. We actually do the same 
uh, for the students and same for the end users uh, for mobile devices, for the enterprise mobility side. So, welcome, Darren. You're gonna use your tablet? Yeah, I'm here. That's okay. Um, welcome. No, I don't have to do a London accent, or I was a Cockney. <laughs> I'm going to use a, uh, an iOS device to de demonstrate uh, some of the work that we're doing in, uh, in the mobile space. Um, and then we'll uh, I'm just going to plug that in. So my name is Darren Gale. I work in the mobile business at Symantec. Um, we've been making some uh, great strides in, in uh, some innovations around the, um, the use of uh, mobile devices, and in particular in the scenarios where you have um, corporately owned, corporately managed devices, but also in the BYOD type scenario as well. <coughs> so um, if I can just uh, plug in here, I'll uh, hopefully get up and going. Right. So this is my uh, iPad mini, my personal iPad mini. It's a, uh, a thing of beauty. I'm sure you'll agree that it's a... Uh, uh, what I'm going to show you on, uh, is a quick demonstration just to whet your appetite in terms of perhaps coming to see us at the Symantec booth and talking about the direction that we're taking in terms of the mobile space a little bit further. So just for a couple of minutes, we figured the best thing we could do is just show you a really quick demonstration of how we can secure the application stack on a mobile device, even when you're not managing the device. Yeah. So um, uh, as you can see, this is just a, um, uh, a bulk standard uh, device here. And what I've done is I've provisioned down on the bottom right-hand bottom right -hand corner here something called uh, Symantec App Center. It's an enterprise app store for, uh, the, uh, for the user base here. So if I open the um, uh, uh, App Center, um, then uh, this, this is actually an instance that we created for the Mobile World Congress uh, event uh, uh, a month or so ago. And you can see here that I've got a, a number of different applications provisioned to me. And there's a, there's a combination in, in, in here of native applications, web applications, secure web applications, and also commercial applications as well. So the demonstration I'm going to give you relates to this uh, expenses application, top left-hand corner. And the first thing I'm going to do is just show you the user experience without any management of that application, yeah? Uh, just so that you can get a feel for the kind of challenges that we're helping uh, our customer base address. So if I click on the, uh, the expenses application here, uh, you can see it's just uh, uh, giving you a little bit of information. Someone's rated this application four stars out of five. When you see the interface, I'm sure you'll be like, golly, they gave it out of four stars. But uh, uh, let's, let's install the application. Um, uh, you do have the opportunity to rate it. Um, but uh, essentially, it's, a, uh, it's a, uh, just a bulk standard install. So we'll run through the install. It's going to appear here on my desktop. You can definitely see this is my, uh, my tablet with my games on there. Um, and uh, let's open the application. Take a look at the application. This is the four out of five stars application. I think you will agree, it's very nice. Uh, but it's, a, it's a, a, just a, a dummy application to demonstrate the point that I'm trying to make. So you can see it's got a native user experience, but there is top right hand corner of this attachment uh, within, this, uh, within this application. If we open the attachment, you'll see that it's a privileged and confidential document. Um, and because of the very rich uh, API set as, uh, uh, that Apple affords you as a, as a developer, then you can do some um, uh, quite uh, uh, unpleasant things uh, with regard to uh, data leakage with this document. So if I touch the screen, you'll see this, the um, menu appear at the top. You have the button there, which is the open in. So I can open in Evernote or my email client and uh, immediately, um, if I open that in Evernote, that then synchronizes with the cloud, right? So I go to another machine over here, log on, and it's a perfect example of what I like to call data lock enablement, yeah? You also have um, uh, in here the ability, if I just uh, uh, click the screen here, you know, of course, um, I can um, uh, select and copy this text from the document, and again, paste that into any of the other applications that are on the device. So what's, what's the, ca the capability that we're kind of bringing to the party here? Um, so if I, if I actually just dip back out of that application and uh, go into the management console, uh, so this is, the, this is the management console of um, uh, App Center is the technology that we're showing you. You can see um, on, on, on this section here, you've got the, um, uh, the expenses application highlighted. And actually on the right hand side here, if you can see the, uh, the, the, uh, the third field down, it says policy, and there's no policy applied to that um, uh, app at the moment. 
So I thought what we could do is create a policy. So let's just create a new policy. Um, uh, and we just do that very easy by clicking here the, um, the, uh, the app policy. Let's call it uh, Bri Forum. Um, and it's a test policy. Um, and in the general settings, um, uh, we're going we're gonna to force now on that application um, uh, user authentication. And you'll notice that uh, enable app SSO is also uh, featured there. So of course, if you have multiple apps that you're deploying to your user base, you don't really want them to be uh, um, authenticating to each individual app as they're, uh, uh, if they're using multiple, uh, multiple apps at a particular time. Um, there are other fields you can you can read these for yourselves in terms of um, uh, some of the restrictions that we can apply. You know, I could show you encryption. Uh, I'd have to jailbreak my device, of course, to show you that, but uh, I don't have much desire to do that. But uh, you'll have to take my word for it on that one. But uh, we can show you perhaps blocking inter-app document sharing and blocking the clipboard functionality. Um, and then there's some other really nice features as we move down here. This fail-safe revocation timer is a particularly nice one. So in the BYOD world, if you've provisioned services to your, your uh, users out there and then their phone is stolen, um, uh, who do you think they tell first when their phone is stolen? You know, they probably tell their telco operator, right, um, that their phone's been stolen. Do you think they're going to tell IT that their BYOD phone has been stolen and they should revoke those services? Probably not. It's probably the last person, uh, the last organization they're going to tell, right? So actually, this fail-safe revocation timer in the application wrapper that we're going to apply to this application has a countdown timer. And in the event that the app doesn't check in, you can revoke the application and the data set automatically. Okay? So it's a poison pill. You also have here network access control. So uh, we could, um, uh, for this particular application, apply some SSL policing uh, type um, restrictions. So uh, you know, my gateway at Symantec.com, uh, SSL port um, for uh, 443, um, uh, and, and, or even put wildcard in it as a scanner port and find a, an available port. Um, and you'll see that from, a, uh, from an SSO perspective, single sign-on perspective, um, you can use um, uh, an external identity provider, and we support the Symantec O3 technology, but also the computer associates SiteMinder and um, Cisco IoT as well. So let's save that policy. Um, so we just, uh, we just created that. You can see it appears here in the list. So let's go back to apps, um, and we'll, we'll again select the expenses app. So um, uh, let's edit the app, and let's apply the policy that will now be in the list. So there's Bry Forum. Uh, let's save that. And if you watch the screen, here's the magic. You'll see wrapping in progress against the policy. So we're taking that, that IPA file in this example, uh, and we're exchanging some libraries in the IPA file, and we're creating a new IPA file which we've signed, okay? And you'll notice the icon has changed as well. It now has the Symantec security tick. So now that application is effectively a new application um, and it's superseding the previous application. So let's, um, let's go back to the user experience. I was kind of hoping that we'd have an Apple push notification button uh, appear on the App Center. For, should we wait? Should we wait? No, let's, uh, uh, obviously the APNS network I'm, uh, uh, is slightly beyond my control. Um, uh, that usually appears quite quickly. Um, so you'd expect the user to see a, a push notification button here. Uh, at least you know the, um, the, de the de demo is real, right? Um, so uh, you will see there is a, uh, um, a push notification button on my apps, and the update has appeared on uh, Expenses app. You'll also see the icon has, has uh, appeared on the, uh, uh, the changed icon has appeared here in the App Store. If I click on Update, then um, uh, it will prompt me to effectively overwrite and supersede that application. So let's update it. Uh, so you can see it's overwriting the application here on the desktop. Um, and uh, we'll run through the same demonstration again. Let's see what happens, right? So uh, we, you, you can remember the restrictions that we applied in terms of that policy. So um, uh, the first thing you'll notice when I open the application, it's going to prompt me for authentication. But I was logged into the client. And so from an SSO perspective, you'll see it's performing a single sign-on activity. So because I've been in the App Store, uh, it's checking my credentials that I've submitted there uh, within the last 30 minutes. Uh, but you can see um, uh, we've got here the, exactly the same application. There's no change. It's still a native user experience. Um, and if I open the attachment, I still open the attachment. 
but now we've got those restrictions that we applied to the um, uh, we've got those restrictions that we applied to the application. So um, uh, if I do the open in, we now have document sharing prohibited, right? So hopefully you'll think that that's quite an interesting uh, uh, kind of capability from now a, a data loss prevention perspective. And also if I select on the screen or try to select on the screen the, uh, the, the, the text, I am pressing the screen, you can see that I'm no longer allowed to uh, select the text from a copy paste uh, clipboard functionality, okay? So the idea here, this is technology which is in the mobile application management space. So I, you know, I'm not managing this device. Um, uh, it's, it's my personal device. There's no policy at a device level. This is policy at an application and content level. Okay, and so, and so if you're interested in the way in which we're taking this technology and in the scenarios that Joe presented, um, uh, extending those scenarios beyond uh, just the delivery of um, a remote frame for servicing the, the, the BYOD user or the corporate user on a tablet form factor. Um, uh, you've got the, the remote frame, you've got the web scenario, we have a policy constrained browser where those same policies can apply to the browser as well, that's a proprietary browser we include, uh, or the wrapper around the, uh, the native applications and the way in which we do that. Okay, so um, uh, really trying to extend our, our capability from a um, uh, beefing up of security posture uh, to all use cases in the way in which these, uh, these users of these devices are consuming these applications. So, you know, hopefully you'll agree that's really exciting technology. And, and you know, again, we're, we're, we're here all day, we're on the booth, uh, we've got in the, um, uh, in the exhibition hall, so come and have a conversation with us about it. Thank you very much, Naren. So it's fantastic. <laughs> So, so the reason why, I mean, you're all here by form for a reason. We're all here to talk about BDI. We're here to talk about consumerization, BYOD, enterprise mobility, application virtualization, streaming. And what you're seeing from ourselves is that what you may have not known about previously, you may have seen bits and pieces, but together we have a collective ability to be able to solve many problems that you're looking to, to you know, back in your, your organizations and businesses today to try and find out You've got these services you need to deliver fast. Um, and you're looking at all these different technologies. But from a single vendor who's got, you know, from it's a VDI scenario to, you know, managed and unmanaged uh, laptops and desktops uh, to be able to provide enterprise management mobility uh, to both managed and unmanaged uh, mobile devices across the board. And all of these things are coming into your environment, environments today. And you're saying that, you know, was it here today? We, we have the solutions to help you. So. At this point in time, we're going to open it up so we can actually have a little bit of time for, for more kind of a Q&A session. So we can have all the th three presenters up in the front here to answer any of the questions that you may have. Um, so let's go ahead and, and uh, if you have a question around, raise your hand. If you have anything that uh, you'd like to say, raise your hand. If you are happy, keep your hands down. So, okay, so anyone, any questions? Is it a direct drive with the Citrix? Um, there's use cases for Citrix in this in kind of a Citrix uh, use case where you've got well connectivity, um, you've got specific applications and, and, and uh, uh, applications you need to provide. Um, Citrix is kind of more of kind of for that, you know, was it well connected scenario that, you know, not having the offline, not having the person be able to go home and, and continue using the applications. So Citrix has this definitely use case in certain areas. We sometimes use some of their technology like user profile management in order to, you know, do some of the profile capabilities in a VDI. Um, so there is some overlap, uh, but uh, both they both have their own use cases to, to be differentiated enough. Yeah, we, we have no hypervisor, right? Correct. So, um, uh, it's, it's mix and match. Correct. So it's a very good question. Thank you. Any other questions? All shocked? All surprised? Question, <laughs> the question at the back. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So it's a very good question. So, so the question, uh, so everyone can hear, is that, uh, oh, is it? Uh, it's coming from a university background as well. And they're looking at virtualization and streaming, um, and the technology is very, very good for the BYOD scenario. 
uh, but some of the licensed vendors out there are not yet ready uh, from the licensing compliance perspective in order to allow their applications to be uh, delivered to unmanaged or BYOD scenarios. So um, there is many applications out there that don't have any issues with uh, virtualization and streaming. There are some um, which is kind of typically lies in the gray area that they don't say yes, they don't say no. Um, we haven't seen any applications to date that doesn't prevent streaming capabilities uh, from a license compliance. Um, and there's many uh, applications out there that do allow the ability to um, user license based. So the scenario from a university perspective, the one that I was involved in, their licensing was site licensing. So while they're able to deliver the applications to all the registered students of the university. So theirs was a site license and their license capabilities was able to do, uh, deliver it to their machines because it was user based. But if you do have a device based licensing, um, that becomes a bit of a challenge because you then need to target the device. And that's where we're going back to the, the scenario before is that um, the managed teachers, we can target the device, so it's a managed machine, and the uh, unmanaged, we can target users. But one of the things that we're trying to evolve as well is to deal with those licensing compliance as well to be able to then also target the device as an unmanaged machine as well. So then your licensing is to a device or to a user. Okay. Uh, I'd also comment as well that um, this transition from device-based licensing to user-based licensing, you know, as a software vendor, we're in the same position, Correct. especially in this mobile space, right? So, so we've responded to the market already, and, and from a mobile perspective, we now license per user. Yeah, so, so um, and it's particularly important as more and more devices per individual emerge, yeah? So mm -hmm. I imagine you're all sitting here, you know, I can see an array of devices in front of people. The, 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 the situation is, is um, uh, apparent that it's not just one device per individual anymore, it's, it's, it's multiple devices. And so there's a lot of pressure on vendors to, to move to a user licensing model, and we've, we've kind of responded to that. So I think you're seeing more and more of that in the market. Yeah, correct. Is it I mean, a named user model you like, or concurrent user? Concurrent user. Concurrent. Um, yeah, so you know, if you've got 10,000 students in, in, in that example, you license the 10,000 nodes, and even if they've got five devices per, per, um, uh, per, per, per user, it's, it's, it's user-based licensing. It's a very good question because it's, it's very important that uh, that's actually a trend that we're seeing with many of the actual software vendors out there that many of them are changing their licensing models very, very uh, fast, um, either to user base or subscription. Yes. Okay. Additional questions? Oh, the guy behind you just answered, put his hand up first, so it's the guy in the t shirt. Does the application provide any uh, VPN tunneling or sort of into a way of getting into a LAN without needing to use VPN? Not a lot of our users like using VPN, unfortunately. Okay, to to which just which scenario to the mobile piece or the so? Yeah, so we have the uh, the SSL policing capability that's on iOS today. Um, uh, that will be on our Android uh, supporting Android uh, shortly, and then we also have um, in the app wrapper uh, in our relatively short term roadmap the the support for full layer three VPN uh, capability mm -hmm. as well. So and. Uh, the, the key thing there, of course, is it's all, you don't need to engineer it into the app. It's all in the wrapper as a post-process application. Yeah? So, so that's, that's coming. Sorry, say again. Fire up the VPN seamlessly. Yes. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, so, um, uh, so the question relates to um, you, you have an application. The application wants to communicate to the, uh, to the enterprise. Um, today, when you apply the wrapper to the, to the application, we can force the SSL uh, transport layer um, encryption on iOS applications, um, but shortly we'll be able to apply full layer three, um, and, and the app will uh, simply perceive that's the only mechanism by which it can communicate. Okay. Thank you much. There's another question here. Oh, okay. Sure. Uh, I know this session's uh, titled, uh, it's all about the app, but uh, what about the data? Um, yeah. You know, is there any kind of Dropbox type capability? Yeah, yeah. So, so, the, um, uh, so it's a really good point. One of the pieces that, if you'd love to come to the stand, I can show you. Um, within the app center, there is a content center component, um, uh, and we can apply security policy um, a similar way to um, to content as we can to the application. And I'd love to show you that demonstration if you if you come along. Um, also. Um, uh, one of the things that's forthcoming in our, our, our 4.2 release, which is our next release, 
is we're supporting third party um, uh, independent software vendor applications with this wrapping technology. So um, if, you're, if you're interested in some of those top tier um, third party file sharing type applications, you know, applications like Excelion um, uh, and so on, then, then actually they're participating with us to provide uh, a degree of pre-wrapping in which you can then apply your policy. So, so actually uh, all, all use cases are applicable. And, and, and in extension to that as well, what we actually just released uh, a week or two ago was Norton Zones. Right. So with yeah. Norton Zones as well, which is our collaboration software basically to do file sharing, and a couple of things that today what you can do is, you know, was it uh, we're looking to enable the uh, um, mobility of the applications themselves between multiple machines through our Norton Zones technology. Uh, but one of the things that we're working on from a technology standpoint, and it's a very good point, is it's all about the apps. But I agree, it's all about the data as well. The data is as more probably important because it's all about, you know, IP protection and, and liability and risk. And that's some of the things we're now working on is that we have the capabilities within our technology to do data isolation not just isolate an application, but also isolate data. That's one of the, our key points is that the solution that we have allows you, you know, you can do applications or virtualized applications, but you can also do data. And that's one of the key points as well. Now, one of the things we're working on from a, can I give a more of a visionary standpoint, is now we can isolate data as well. Now we want to be able to put policies and be able to share the data between multiple points using uh, Norton Zones technology. Or, you know, if, if you're not using Norton Zones and other technologies like Dropbox, et cetera. But the that's the important thing, is not just virtualizing the application, but isolation of data, encryption of the data, and a collaboration sharing of the data between either multiple machines for a single user or teams of people who need access to that data as well. So that's a very important point. Thank you for asking the question, because it allows us to show yeah. some of the other capabilities that we're kind of more technology working towards, more visionary side of things. So thank you. So I think that was the last question we have time for. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time and coming to our, to our session and listening to all the things that we have. Um, was it thank you very much for everyone who's been uh, just up and presenting?